Hey ladies and gentlemen, it's Steve here. Before we get started this week, I want to let you know that on BJJ Mental Models Premium, we just launched an awesome three-part series with four-time world champ Dominica Obelinite. It's about competition and the crushing emotional pressure that can go along with it. Critical listen for anyone who's a competitor or really anyone who works in a high-stress environment. Give it a shot, premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. You can check it out and get a free trial. Give it a listen. If you don't like it, cancel with no risk. Again, premium.bjjmentalmodels.com and enjoy the show. Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models episode 152. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach, and today I am pleased to be joined by one of my favorite guests of all time, Mr. Travis Stevens. Travis, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Favorite of all time. (laughs) (laughs) I haven't heard that one before. The last episode we did, I was talking to my brother about this. It was uh, a long time ago. It was episode 94, but you were talking about a champion's mindset. And I actually, when we went back and edited it, my brother and I both agreed, man, it was super inspiring. Like the way that you talk about competing and about the realities of competition, both in terms of how you can motivate yourself and the sacrifices you have to make. It it actually kind of got us fired up as we were editing it. It made me want to go in and train. So it was a, it was an awesome chat and something that you touched on there which i've really wanted to dig in deeper with you is the process of goal setting you had mentioned in our previous recording that when you are prepping your students for competition when someone comes to your academy and they tell you their dream is to become a world champ one of the first things you do with them is you sit down and you have a real heart-to-heart pragmatic talk about what that actually means and make sure there really is indeed something that they want to do. And you also talked about how you have a a goal setting plan that you put in place that runs throughout the year. And I've never heard of anyone doing this before in jujitsu. It, what it really sounded to me was actually like a, a career plan or a performance plan that you might encounter at work where your manager sits down and helps you figure out how to get to the next promotion and they set out a multi-year plan. And I'd love to dig into this and talk about how you do it. I mean, as someone who has been at, you know, successful at the Olympic level, at the highest of all levels, and as someone who also has trained other successful competitors, I'd love to get your thoughts on how this all works. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. You know, you, I guess it's straightforward for me because I do it every day, right? It's, it might not be so straightforward for somebody that's, you know, kind of wakes up every day and, you know, lives their life in such a way where, you know, they deal with the thing right in front of them every day instead of making sure that the things that are in front of them are helping them to get to where they want to go. And a lot of players and a lot of athletes, they misconstrued that correlation of making sure that the things that are in front of you today are making you get to where you want to be tomorrow as dealing with the things in front of them today and you'll get to where you want tomorrow. They're two completely different statements. You know, a lot of it has to do with being able to compartmentalize your day-to-day life in such a way that one area of your life doesn't really affect the other. I mean, at the end of the day, it will. It's your job to make sure that you're in the present and making sure that your present is the right one for you so that your plan or your goal or where you're trying to get to in life can be achieved. Otherwise, one day you'll wake up and it'll be 10 years later and you'll have nothing to show for it. I'm reminded of that old quote that people often overestimate what they can get done in one year, but they underestimate what they can get done in 10 years. And I I definitely feel that there have been entire years that have gone by where I kind of look back and I'm not really satisfied with what I did And I sort of feel like I'm drifting. But then there's also been times when I look back with a wider lens at what I've accomplished in the last decade. And I surprise even myself sometimes by how much has gotten done. So time is a tricky thing because it is so easy for it to run away from you. And there's a lot of 
resources out there in today's day and age, you know, with the internet, social media, you know, direct access to people who are where you're trying to get to. And I think a lot of people have an idea of what they're willing to put into something. And then they make that fit into their goal instead of the goal determining what they need to put into it. You know, a lot of people come to me and Jimmy and this club with the aspirations of being an Olympian, right? Being a world champion. And they come from somewhere where maybe they were the big fish, right? They're one of the best judo players. Everybody in their hometown has told them how great they are. And, you know, they're going to be the next greatest thing. And when they sit down with us and they get analyzed in their, their judo and their athleticism and their mindset and how they think, it all gets broken down into these very simple things that get judged. It's hard for people to take that criticism and grow from it because if you think you can reach the next level or reach the highest level with what you're doing today, then you're wrong. Because if what you are doing today is enough, you would already be at the highest level. You never want to take what you're doing today and then say, well, if I keep doing this, over time, I'll get to where I want to go. You know, there's that whole saying in business where do you have 10 years of experience or do you have one year of experience 10 times, right? Because you get stuck in the rat race of doing the same thing day in and day out. You forget that you need to actually grow as a person, as an athlete, both mentally and physically to reach the next level. And a lot of people struggle with that concept. Yeah, I I feel what you're saying, man. And I have heard and I love that quote about having one year of experience 10 times because you see that so often where people might be very good at executing the loop they're in. They might be very good at having taken their work and turned it into a routine. And that routine may even be very important, but... It's really hard to grow if you're just doing the same thing over and over again, because the steps that you need to move out of your stratosphere and into the next stratosphere often require a lot of sacrifice and a lot of change. As a hobbyist myself, I made peace a long time ago with the role that jujitsu would have in my life and how much I'm willing to put into that. And a big part of that is, of course, understanding that there are people who put a much greater investment into jujitsu. My brother, for example, his career is jujitsu. He's a professional competitor. He runs a gym. His entire work and professional existence is based around the sport. Whereas for me, it's a hobby that has greatly benefited my life, but it's still a hobby. And so the way that he has to operate and the things that he has to sacrifice to achieve his goals are totally different from mine. And neither of which is right or wrong, but it's just a matter of being open and honest about that. And something that you had brought up in our last chat was how when someone comes to you with that crazy aspirational statement, like they walk into the gym and they say, I want to be an Olympian. One of the first things that you mentioned you do is you try to hit them with reality in terms of what that means and specifically what they're going to have to sacrifice. You know, almost certainly it will impact their relationship with their partner, possibly with their wider family. It will make it harder to be a parent. It will make you sacrifice whatever other job you may or may not have going on. And I thought it was really cool that rather than starting people up by trying to ramp them up and get them all jacked up, you provide them with a very realistic stance about what they're actually asking for because they probably haven't thought through all of the implications, quite honestly. It's one of those things where I've gone through it. I've seen enough people go through it. And, you know, at some point, life is going to punch you in the face at some point. It's just going to happen. And I would rather be the person to punch that guy in the face you know, metaphorically speaking, with the reality check of like, hey, are you going to do this? Is this 
really what you're going to put your mind to. And then their actions will speak volumes. Everyone will say yes, but their actions won't. And when their actions start slipping, that's when you start getting on the athletes and you start trying to get more and more out of them. And it's until they realize themselves, like what they're really putting into it versus what they need to put into it, where they're going to make that mental shift. You know, we don't, I personally don't, as a coach, as somebody who helps people get to that next level, have the patience or the resources to drag them there. In some sports, they have the resources and the means to drag an athlete to the finish line, right? There are some people I run into them all the time where it's like, if I picked you up every morning and I drove you to the gym, you would work out. If I show up to the gym, there are certain athletes that will show up. If I never show up to the gym and I just expect them to go, half the team won't be there by week two because they're going to be tired, they're going to be broken, and there's not going to be anybody there to hold them accountable because they don't hold themselves accountable because at the end of the day, they really don't want it. How do you suss that out when you're talking to these people? Is there a, a tell or an indicator that you identify early on when you're talking to someone that gives you real clarity as to, okay, this guy, girl, is serious about this versus this person isn't going to hang around? Is there a, an early indicator that you can point to that you normally see as a pattern? Yeah, a lot of people will hang around just to say that they're doing it because most people hang on to the idea that, you know, they're hopefuls, you know, like the way my brain works. And you said it earlier with your brother where it's like, well, he's a professional athlete and he runs a school that in and of itself is backwards to me. If you're a professional, how are you running a school? Yes. And, and it's funny you bring that up because that is exactly the dilemma he finds himself in now, right? As he gets older, he's got a balance these two things and that is there's no balance yeah he's, there is no balance he's half in as an athlete you can't call yourself a professional unless you're a professional and i think a lot of people in sports and in the jiu-jitsu community we have sorry for the language but you bastardized the term professional right like hockey players aren't playing in the nhl and coaching MLB players aren't playing baseball professionally and running teams on the side. Like they have downtime where they might help. Like athletes may, you know, have time to work at camps or do like side gigs, but that's not their profession, right? Like soccer players in England and footballers, like that's what they do. And then they do things on the side like help out at camps, do other things, but there's another organization or another program that's operating it and they're using the athlete's image and name and they're coming together to do this action. But when jujitsu players are calling themselves professionals as athletes and school owners, there's no end. Yes. You don't, that's a misinterpretation of what a professional means. I completely agree with you on this. And I recall you bringing this up in the last chat we had. You were, I believe we used Gordon Ryan as the example. And I think you said that he was kind of the one true professional in the sport, meaning that he is fully invested in his competitive success. He has built a team around him to help him get there. He has built processes around him to help him build himself up to where he needs to be. And he doesn't have a lot of distractions. Like, I mean, granted, the situation has changed with him a bit now. But at yeah. the time, I agree with you 100% in terms of how he structures his work. And that is something that is weird about jujitsu. With jujitsu, it really feels to me that people who train jujitsu, they almost treat it kind of like a uh, a health or wellness endeavor, kind of like yoga, where it's all about, I want to live the lifestyle, but you don't see the same kind of competitive focus that you do in other sports, where it is expected to be your full-time job. You will see a lot of jujitsu people who, you know, they cut their time between competing and doing traveling seminars and running their gym. But most of the truly successful competitors that I know, their focus is 
doing the work to be a good competitor. And they're putting as much time into that as I would put into my day job, for instance. Yeah. And part of that whole, you know, professional hobbyist thing is having that team around you whose goal it is, is to make sure you succeed. Because if you're a professional, you're not doing it alone. Yeah. Right. And a lot of people don't don't understand that because they're purple belts, they're brown belts in jujitsu that are like, well, I've quit my job. I'm living on beans and rice and I'm training full time and I'm going to become a world champion. It's like, that's not a professional. Yeah. Like you don't have the resources. That's a starving artist. That's not yeah. a professional. Like you're the club you're in is clearly not built to, you know, develop and grow a successful athlete. It's you may win a couple matches, you may even win a world title, but the only reason why you're winning is because the sport in and of itself is a hobbyist sport. That is absolutely true, in fact. And I, as of the timing of this episode, of course, in the jujitsu world, it has been a, a challenging year. You know, there have been a lot of revelations about sexual misconduct in the sport, which frankly, unfortunately, aren't surprising to me. And I think a large part of that is because. Jiu-Jitsu is really not regulated or controlled as a sport. I mean, I have... It's a hobbyist. It, it is a hobby, and it doesn't really have the kind of rigor and discipline and structure that you get out of a sport. Um, my friend, Kathy Hubble, she's won world championships in both Judo and Jiu-Jitsu, and she teaches both. So she kind of lives with one foot in both sports and is very interesting hearing her tell the difference to me. Because when she talks about judo, it comes across as very regimented, organized, and professional. And she's even shared some of the correspondence that she gets from judo federations with me. And it's like they, they run like a real business. Whereas jujitsu runs like, I mean, kind of like a bunch of loosely connected yoga studios. <laughs> and I don't mean that as an insult. I mean, one of the things about jujitsu is that it is so cool as a, a lifestyle improver but as a sport it, it is very underdeveloped i feel compared to some of the other sports that you would see at for example the olympic level of course you would be the expert in this so i'd love to know if you agree with that or if you have a different perspective yeah it's a it's a great way of putting it i mean part of the reason jujitsu has exploded is because of its lack of regimen right like there are no checks and balances if you have zero experience, you can slap jujitsu up on your wall and start teaching. You could watch a YouTube video 20 minutes before class and teach what you watched. And as long as you're a likable person and you have a CRM and way to collect the money, people will pay you for it because they're not going to know the difference because there's no, there's no checks and balances on the idea of how did this person even have the ability to open up a school? No background checks are done. No, nothing is ever done on any of these people. And it's kind of a scary thought that there are people out there that have other people's lives in their hands because some of the things you teach people, they're a little dangerous, right? Even the idea of being able to choke somebody unconscious, as simple as it sounds, in the wrong hands, like, it's a scary thought. Yeah. You know, as somebody with no experience that bought a black belt online for $12 and a gi for, you know, 50 bucks on eBay can open up a school. Yeah. And even for the people who, from a skill perspective, technically would be considered qualified, I feel like we we very heavily weight the importance of the black belt in jiu-jitsu and we kind of assume that if this person has achieved that level then they must have everything together and they must be completely qualified to to be an instructor and to run a business but in reality there's a lot more that I think we should consider in terms of what we want out of our coaches versus just how good are they individually at the sport you know we we don't really have any professional designations in jiu-jitsu other than i guess the black belt itself which like you mentioned is not regulated really at all we don't really have any expectations from coaches in terms of their business training their business ethics and all of that does kind of 
I, I think fall apart. And I think one example of where that that does fall apart is when it comes to how coaches try to run up their students to get them into a high level competition. Because to your point, it seems to me like for a lot of coaches, there isn't really a regimented process. It is more just train hard, show up at the gym six to eight hours a day, just keep training and then go to the competition. And maybe there will be some chat about game plan, but there isn't a broader process around building this person up. And like you said, in in any true professional institution, you have a team and the team is there to support each other. And everyone's job is to ensure the success of everyone else and you all move forward together. Whereas I don't quite feel like we have that in jujitsu in most, in most gyms anyway. Yeah, you know, there are a lot of everybody runs a gym for a different reason some people do it because they want to run the best local jiu-jitsu team and be the toughest kid on the block and some people do it because they like people they think jiu-jitsu is a great sport it's a great outlet and they're not wrong and some people do it because they believe in like bushido and the martial artist and it is what it is And then there's that group of, hey, this is a great business opportunity. I can make some money at this. Let's do this. And each one has its, you know, pluses and minuses. Like for my school in general, I don't run a competitive jiu-jitsu school. You know, I I run a jiu-jitsu school because it's a place where people can come learn. It's a place where people can hang out, get a good workout, and learn a life skill and test themselves. Above and beyond that, I'm not the school for you, right? I have people at my school that do compete and compete at a higher level, but that's not to say that I support or condone it or expect it. You know, I'm not going to show up Matt's side and start coaching these guys because they were a hobbyist. We're a hobbyist club that does it purely for the enjoyment aspect and the physical benefits of the sport. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's something that I can relate to myself having, uh, you know, been on that side of the equation where I I am a hobbyist. Uh, Sometimes when I've gone to gyms, I feel like it's just not the gym for me because there isn't an emphasis on properly training hobbyists. What's weird is sometimes you'll go to a gym and they will consider themselves a competitive gym. But if you actually look at it, 95% of their students never compete. But just the instructor has it in their head, I guess, that competition is the way you do jujitsu. And so they kind of outsize focus on the people they think they can turn into competitive stars, which is probably actually not the smartest way to run your business if you're only catering to 5% of your customer base. But I I have seen that as a very common thing in jujitsu where instructors are not totally open about what the goals of their students are. They expect the students to be cookie cutters of themselves, but they don't take into account that many students don't have the same lofty inspirations and motivations that the instructor might have had when they were younger. Yeah. It's, you know, everybody's just a little bit different. It's just, as long as you understand, you know, what your mission is and why you're doing it, you have a good opportunity to be successful as long as you understand that. So something I'd like to do is maybe dig into a bit of specifics here. When you do goal setting with your your students. Do you do that with all students or just with the competitors? How does that work and shake out in practice? Because I can imagine it blowing up into a lot of work to do. Yeah, it's not with everybody. It's specifically people that come with the idea of either A, on the judo side of it, looking for that Olympic or world aspiration, right? Like they want to be the next Jimmy Pedro, Kayla Harrison, or Travis Stevens, you know? And on the jujitsu side of it, we do it every once in a while with rank. Some people feel like they're not progressing and, you know, they feel like their rank is how they identify their skill and who they are. They don't care if they can beat somebody or not beat somebody. They need to see that stripe on the belt or a new belt color come into play. And then we have to have a long heart to heart as to why they're stuck in this path. And a lot of times it's because they're stuck in a rat race where they're not doing anything new. Yeah. Yeah. I have definitely found myself in that trap where, I mean, I think anyone who's trained for a while can relate to the idea of hitting a plateau, but what that means to me has changed a lot over the years as I've trained. When I started training as a white belt and a blue belt, 
you know, hitting a plateau is inevitable and it feels devastating when it happens for the first time because it just feels like a, you're in a depressive state where you can't achieve anything. But now when I, you know, I've been training for as long as I have and I've been through multiple plateaus, I kind of see the pattern and how to deal with them. And I realize that a plateau is actually not such a scary thing. It's an opportunity to improve because if I'm hitting a plateau, really what that means is I've kind of run up against the ceiling of what my existing strategies can do for me. And I need to go into the wilderness and try new things to make bigger commitments, to explore new ideas, and maybe to discard some of the things that got me to where I am now that no longer serve me. As you know, someone who has trained for, for fun, but also does take it quite seriously, I know what it's like when you want to win on the mats. And often a mistake I find people make is they go into every role in the gym trying to win. So they're always, always, always playing their a game because they want to win but if you want to win then you're not necessarily experimenting and trying other things and i'd love to know if that factors into your goal setting when you when you help people set goals do you give them very tactical or technique specific things where you help them work on something in specific or do you operate at a more high level it's a little bit of both you know a lot of our goal settings aren't just geared around sport there's a sport component to it, but it also has a lot to do with, you know, where they're trying to get to in life. It's important to make sure that your life goals and your sport goals are both moving along in the same direction, because if you get 80% of the way to your life goal and then, or your sport goal rather, and then all of a sudden you realize your life's not where you want it to be, then you start actually trying to play catch up on your life goals and then your sport goal kind of starts to drift away. Yeah. And you have to be intelligent enough to understand that both your life goal and your sport goal are ticking time bombs. At some point, there's an end date to it that you just can't accomplish it anymore, right? It becomes unrealistic. Like, if you wanted to set two goals, I want to be world champion and I want to be a millionaire. My first question is when on both accounts, because depending on where you put that date and how old you are, it's going to determine how we have to attack both these problems because both are doable, but determining how much effort we put into one or the other is going to affect greatly on the date. I love the point you're bringing up about how you adopt a more holistic goal setting approach and even factor in other life considerations because jujitsu doesn't exist in a bubble. And if you want to goal set for jujitsu, every commitment that you make in terms of the sport is a subtraction from something else in life. And those need to be honest conversations you have with your coach. I mean, if you are really serious about hitting some competitive goal and making that level of commitment, you need to be cognizant of what you're giving up at the same time. And if you don't take that into account, you're just going to wind up creating a goal that can never succeed. Because like you said, at some point you'll run up against that wall where you're being asked now to sacrifice something that you don't want to sacrifice. And yeah, what you don't want is a situation where you get 80 or 90% of the way through the journey and then decide that actually it's not the journey that you wanted it to be, or it's not what you thought it would be at the end of the day. Yeah. A lot of the youth struggle today. You know, a big one that we have to deal with a lot is college. Like what happens? What do we do? Yeah. Do you send your kid to college or does he train to become a world champion? And you don't have the option to get a jujitsu university scholarship yet. So that proves to be a pretty challenging choice for a lot of people. Even in judo, it wouldn't matter if you had a scholarship or not, because for judo, you got to compete year round. Yep. It's, it's a quad with a two year qualification process. It's like, could you really take a full semester's worth of classes and train for the games? Even wrestlers struggle with that same thing. It's like, do I go to college and risk missing my Olympic year? Cause I have to wrestle folk style versus doing freestyle. Right. And you would just have to ask yourself, like, where do I see myself when I'm 30 and I'm planning on college? Because 
where you plan on being in life matters. If you want to be a doctor, you should probably go to school and, you know, try judo and hopefully you get there. But if your life passion is being a doctor, that has to come first and foremost because that industry has put a prerequisite above and beyond what you could possibly do for judo or even BJJ. So there are certain things that you have to, when somebody sits down at your club and decides to do something like, you have the obligation as a coach to, you know, look at the bigger picture for them and help guide them in making the right choice for them, having life experience on your side. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think one of the funny things about our sport is that we catch people very young during a very impressionable period of their lives. They fall in love with the sport and they want to kind of make it their whole existence, but they yep. don't necessarily have the life experience to understand what that means. I mean, when you're 15 or 20 years old, being 30 or 35 is almost unfathomable. And not, not just in terms of the age, but in terms of the changing priorities you'll have in your life. I mean, I, I never truly understood how much having a child would impact my life until I did. I thought I did because everyone said, oh, well, it's going to change everything, but it is a complete shift in mindset and priorities. And that's just a natural part of life and growing up is that your priorities do change. So it is important if you're young and you want to get into this thing full time, you've got to really consult with, you know, the, the gray hairs. You probably have a better life perspective because they can see the road ahead that you probably can't yet see. And they they see some of the common pitfalls, like you said, about like, what if, you know, what about your career aspirations outside of the sport? That's always one. Education, of course, is another one. There's always going to be something that gets thrown at you. And I think a lot of the time people make decisions very, very early on in their lives without really the context to realize that, for most people, their their competitive career is going to end in their mid thirties, and you got a lot of working years after that. So you better have a plan. Yeah, and a lot of people don't when they're guiding these these kids and these people, they don't they don't think past like their life with that person, right? Like, yeah, let's become a world champion. I can do that for you. But then when we've won the world title and my school is booming good luck. I didn't, you didn't ask me about the rest of your life, but you have a responsibility to that person to ensure that they're making the best decision for them, not just in relationship to the sport and the room that you're a part of, right? You have to understand that you're just a piece on the board that they're trying to move and navigate through life. Yeah. I, I really like that long view where you're you're caring for people even after your time with them expires. I know a lot of people who chose jiu-jitsu competition as their career and even some of them did extremely well at it, but then once that competitive period of their life ends, you kind of hit this existential crisis sometimes where if you haven't really figured out a plan in terms of what to do next, you wind up with yourself in a situation now where the the skills that you developed are you know your your ability to perform is diminished because you've gotten older that is one of the things about the perils of being an athlete is unlike a lot of other career skills your competitive ability diminishes as you get older it doesn't increase like with a lot of other careers so I see a lot of people who get to that point where they wrap their competitive career and they have to ask themselves now what? And they don't have an answer to that. And so I think it's great that coaches take an interest in that and help people understand what life is going to be like after you part ways and they move on to the next phase of their life. You hear about it a lot with the Olympics, right? A lot of athletes suffer through a depression once the Olympic Games is over with because they don't know what to do. They're, they're lost. It's like, floating around in the universe, just trying to figure out like what's next. Because when they're athletes, they're told what to do. It's a lot like being in the military. Like, oh, you're supposed to go to the gym at 6 a.m. You're supposed to be at morning running. You're supposed to be at the morning training session. You're supposed to have lunch here. 
You're supposed to go meet with the sports psychologist. Don't forget, you have afternoon sparring, you have nighttime sparring. You have to do your recovery work. You got to do your stretching. You have to have this meal. It's very easy because you have this team of people who are helping you to do these things. And then the second you're done becoming an athlete, you've never thought for yourself. You've never thought past what's going to happen in a lot of athletes in all sports that have the Olympics attached to it, they suffer and they get depressed because they go from being seen as, you know, you're the greatest in the world on top of the world. The sport loves you to your yesterday's news. And now you're pretty much 30, 25, 28, sometimes 35. And now you've got to start day to day life behind because while you were a rock star in college, all those kids who weren't got into the workforce and now they have four, eight, 12 years of experience. And now you're a 30 year old person with no job experience trying to get a job and no corporation and no business really wants to hire, you know, a 30 year old with no job experience, even with a college degree. Yeah. And so when when you open up a school, when you get your black belt, you have to understand that people look at you like you know what you're talking about, right? Like people people who join martial arts schools, they join for so many different reasons. People will ask coaches like relationship advice, like they're therapists. They're jujitsu coaches. They're not therapists. You might as well have asked the guy down at the local bar or a guy at the bus stop. Like people, when they see a black belt, they're instantly assume they know what they're talking about. And that is not the case. Yeah, this is one of my favorite things about the martial arts. And I, I don't know where it comes from. I don't know if it's the symbolism because you see this black belt and I mean, you know, we grew up watching Hollywood movies and the understanding is that a black belt is like the wise man on the mountain who dispenses wisdom and he can beat up 10 people at the same time. In reality, the black belt is just the guy who showed up to the gym and didn't stop. Right? I mean, people say things like a black belt is like a doctorate. It absolutely is not like a doctorate. Not even close. Yeah. To get a doctorate, you have to actually provide some new knowledge to the world that has never been obtained before. You have to actually advance human knowledge. To be a black belt, you just need to not quit for about 10 years. I mean, I'm a black belt. I have literally never competed at jujitsu and I am still a black belt. I've done nothing. <laughs> get this. Get this. To be a black belt, all you have to do is name something and buy it online. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, getting a black belt and getting a reputation is in a lot of ways about branding and marketing more than any actual competitive skill because half the world champions in jujitsu are self-proclaimed. Yep. Half the guys who won it, they didn't even have matches in the final because of a teammate. Mm -hmm. Think about that really quick. You're a multiple time world champion that didn't have to fight for it because your sport wasn't developed enough to be competitive enough where you met your friend in the final. Yeah, yeah. It It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You dedicated how much of your life to playing paper, rock, scissors in the final? What's the actual importance of this thing that we're calling a world title? If it can be decided over a paper, rock, scissors match or just a, hey, you can have it this time because I'll get it next time. It is funny. I have a friend who won a, a very high level jujitsu competition. Uh, he took gold and I got a photo of him and he's the only person on the podium. There's a one and there's yeah. a, an empty two and an empty three. And it's because due to technicalities and other problems, nobody showed up in his division. <laughs> Technically, he's the champion, but he didn't even compete once. He just showed up, didn't compete, was given a medal. That was the end of it. So yeah, the the importance of a jiu-jitsu world championship is, I, I mean, I'm not going to say it's not a major accomplishment. It is a massive accomplishment. But when people compare jiu-jitsu world champions, championships to pretty much any other regulated sport. It's not even comparable, right? I mean, to get... But that's the, 
that's the kicker right there is like an intelligent person understands that. But when somebody walks into your gym and they go, oh, you're learning from the multiple time world champion. It's like, the, like jujitsu hasn't even gotten to the point of demanding that the athletes, you know, prefix their world titles. It's just world champion. How are you yeah. 23 years old and you're a seven time world champion? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, you are. You, you're absolutely right. And I know it's getting better and I know it's moving in the right direction, but the sport has to have some sort of like self regulation because when you put those things out there, one, people from other sports look at it like it's a joke. Two, the people that, are coming into the sport for the first time, when they hear that, they think something different and they're trying to get credibility from something that they haven't really accomplished yet. Yeah. And I think part of the challenge here is when you take all of these things and you roll them together. So, you know, a person who doesn't know anything about jujitsu shows up and they want to train. And in front of them is this person wearing a black belt who is advertised as a world champion. There's a lot of signals given off that this person is a like a person of authority. And it's pretty easy to kind of just blindly follow that person and do whatever they say. Yes. So, yeah, I, I see this a lot where jujitsu coaches will they will be asked for relationship advice even financial advice sometimes mm -hmm. all sorts of things and it's just funny because i can't imagine that in any other walk of life i mean i can't imagine going to my accountant and asking him to look over my meal prep plan <laughs> right yeah. but in jujitsu it is very common to go to a professor and start asking them about what to do about my girlfriend or my boyfriend and you know how should i invest my money or you know ask for medical advice even and i i know that as a black belt as the guy at the front of the class you feel pressured to have the answer for everything and sometimes people just wing it and they make it up but and that's a problem right there in and of itself. Yeah, it, it definitely is. I, I had a conversation yesterday with an athlete because I was in my office, practice was over and I was working on some spreadsheet stuff for Fuji Sports. And one of the coaches is talking to one of the athletes and he's he's an older kid, he's like 21. And he was like asking him questions about like what he learned or something. And the athlete was like, you know, he was trying to answer the question. And then I could just hear the bullshit just coming from his mouth. I could just hear it. <laughs> and so I poke my head out the door and I look at him. I go, hey, let me just give you like a little bit of like life advice here. A little bit. If somebody asks you a question and you don't know, just tell them straight up. Like, I don't know. Go tell me what the answer is or go seek professional advice. Don't bullshit your way through an answer. I go, it's not a guess. Like he asked you if you knew. He didn't ask you to guess. You either know or you don't. There's no gray area. Because even if you're right and you guessed, you're not learning. You just wipe the sweat off your brow like, oh, I got away with that one. Yeah. You're, well, you're giving yourself false positives too as a yeah. coach, right? Because in the chance that you get it right, now you're just going to think, well, maybe I am an expert in this, right? Maybe I actually should be giving financial advice to my students. People DM me all the time like, hey, like, how should I be training for this event? Like, I don't fucking know. I don't know you. <laughs> I don't know what your resources are like. I don't know what your athletic ability is like. Like, how, how could I possibly answer that in an intelligent fashion? And people get upset with me, but like, like stop reaching out to people just to either reconfirm what you already know, or you're actually looking for advice to follow. Don't reach out to people in positions that can't possibly answer the question in an intelligent manner. I think that what happens a lot is people are looking for 
that one liner, that little yeah. nugget of wisdom, the, the memeable quote that will change their life. And they're hoping that, man, maybe if I reach out to this famous Olympian, he'll have the answer for me. He'll just he'll like DM me the one sentence that will totally change how my brain is wired. But that kind of falls back to, again, I think, incorrect expectations of what a coach can do. Your coach is not someone who can program your brain and, and be like a font of wisdom. Your coach is really there to facilitate your own growth. But at the end of the day, the best coaches that I know, they're not directing and dictating. They're kind of facilitators and they're helping you learn and develop yourself and they're providing more gentle guidance. They're really, it's very unlikely that someone who doesn't even know who you are is going to be able to give you a bit of advice that will totally change your life because context matters, right? Every person's journey is different. Correct. And people, people need to understand that. So something I would love to know is do you, when you plan with your athletes, is there a an existing process that you follow? Is there a, like a model that you've discovered that you use that other people would be familiar with? Or is it something that you've invented on your own? It's something Jimmy used with me. I'm not 100% sure where he got it, but it basically, it forces the athletes to answer questions very specifically. And they're usually usually athletes have to do it at least two or three times before they get to a point where a member of the coaching staff is content with where the answers lie. How would that look though? If I'm one of your students and I come in and I, I say, Hey, I want to be a world champ, right? How, how does that actually look in practice when we set these goals and we go through those layers of peeling back the onion? What kind of model would you use and what would the steps look like? The, the practices you would be doing are generic. They're the ones that are just there for everybody else. Our practices don't change per person. How you're treated at practice changes, right? We can have, you know, everyday people at class intermixed with people who are trying to be Olympic champions. It's just how you interact with the Olympic champions is different than how you interact with the everyday grappler, right? the way you speak, how you speak, the level of expectations, the precision within the techniques, um, how closely you monitor mistakes, the severity in which you lash out when mistakes are made. It all gets changed because the person trying to be the Olympian or the world champion at that next level, like the smallest of details matter. You can't make those mistakes at that level. But the weekend warrior can still have a good time, make a couple of mistakes. And as long as it looks right and they understand the general principle and idea, we're pretty much happy with it. Yeah. So there's kind of like a, it sounds like what you're saying is there's sort of a good enough point. Yeah. Like you can't, I can't expect a guy that comes in three times a week to be at the level of somebody that should be training 12 to 14 times a week. Like it's, it's unrealistic. It is one of the interesting things about wanting to do a, a sport competitively is, man, if you want to really succeed in a sport and be competitive in that sport and make a career out of it, you've got to be in like the very, very, very upper echelon of people who perform. Whereas if you want to do a career, you don't necessarily have to be in the 99th percentile to actually be very, very successful. It's much more forgiving. Yeah. So that is one of the things I find as a hobbyist is I can get to a good enough point and still see growth and see progress and be happy with the whole endeavor. But I can only imagine how much harder it would be <laughs> if I am expected to be in the 99th percentile of jujitsu practitioners. Like I had a, I had a conversation with a kid, young kid, he must have been, uh, he's not quite 16 yet. He's 15 years old. Stud of an athlete, right? He, he has God's gift of like, I'm an athlete, right? Just born and raised, like comes naturally to him. And he's like, I would win the cadet world, right? And I'm like, no. And he goes, really? I think I would win it. And I go, you're not even competitive. And he wrestles, this kid wrestles. He wrestles at a very high level, like Fargo level high, like super third, super 32, like medalist contender high. But then I have to give him like these reality checks to make sure he understands that he's not that good. 
And he has a lot of work to do to make it to that next level. And when you think about it, there are 132 countries that compete in the sport of judo. Let's say you're number three in the country and you feel like a stud. What's three times 132? <laughs> yeah. Right? Like you're not even in the ballpark yet. You're not. Even if our top three are better than most of those other countries, you're still not even getting a shot. Right. And that's not to say like the top 10 in some countries are better than our top 50. Right. So you've really got to start like putting things into perspective and dialing it back mentally in your head so that you can stay focused, keep your head down and keep developing and keep working, especially from a young age. So we have to make sure that these athletes, when we set those goals, like, hey, my, my, I don't even want you to think about being world number one. I don't even want you to think about being a world champion. Like, I want you to think about you and the decisions you can make and where you personally need to be as like a goal. We can set competition goals later, but I need your goals for your personal growth and where you need to be. Then when we set the actual goal of, I want to be a cadet world champion, great. Do your physical goals and your mental goals meet the standard of being a cadet world champion, yes or no? And if the answer is no, then it's not, you're not winning, right? Sometimes that gap is too far. Yeah, yeah. Let me ask a question here because this, this is something I'd love to know. Athletes often come in with a very specific time-based, event-based goal in mind. Like yep. they'll say, I want to be world champion they might even give a year, right? They might want to yep. say, I want to be world champion by the time I'm 25 or something to that effect. I would love to know, do you, and to what extent do you coach them towards a specific event-based goal versus just general process of improvement? Because a problem that happens a lot is, of course, an athlete will base their entire identity around, you know, I want to win the 2021 Mundials. And then if they fail to do that, and of course, like you mentioned, for reasons that are might even be outside of the person's control, you cannot simply guarantee that someone will win something like that. It can really be crushing to their sense of identity. And so I'd love to know, do you do you provide very, very specific outcome-based goals like that? Like our goal is to get you to be a world champion or is it more about the process and how do you balance those two things? There's both. There's the, hey, you're going to write down, you're going to be Olympic champion. There's no two ways about it. And then you're also going to write down the goals you need to accomplish in order to be Olympic champion, right? Like Athletes do this all the time, especially in the sport of judo. It's a perfect example because they'll go to the Olympics and be like, I'm ready to win. And I, I look at them and I'm like, how can you possibly say that? You've never won a grand slam. You've never won a world title. You're not even ranked inside the top 10 in the world, but you're ready to win the Olympics. It's a puncher's chance. That's not real. Even if you won it, it's not real. Like you didn't earn it. You haven't developed. You got lucky. So-and-so got sick. This person didn't show up. You know, that person broke their leg during the match and you won anyways, right? That's not like preparing to be Olympic champion or preparing to be a world champion. Like a person not knowing you should be able to look on a sheet of paper at your stats and your capabilities and say, yeah. I'd bet on this person. That's when you know you have a shot. And that's what you're preparing these people to do. And that's what you're preparing for them to become, is to give them a fighting chance, not a puncher's chance. You can never guarantee it, but you could pretty much look on a sheet of paper and say, hey, like if I had to spell out like at the highest level, like world champion, what would be the things underneath that that you would expect a world champion to do? Oh, well, they should probably medal at a couple of these events. They would be able to beat this number of people inside the top five. They would have at least one win against everybody in their division. You know, like you'd be able to like put these things into perspective to make the unobtainable obtainable because you're biting off like these smaller chunks of information. And when you make the goals really minute and narrow focused, they're very easy to accomplish. 
It's just there's more of them to accomplish. Fantastic, man. Well, I I think that this is a super nuanced problem. And of course, it is a very personal thing in terms of how to help people goal set. If there's a, a coach out there listening to this and they're looking to take a more active role in setting goals for their students, is there any closing thoughts or final advice you would offer that we haven't gotten to yet in this conversation? Yeah. I mean, I guess just to wrap it up, the number one thing is like, stay in your lane, stay in your lane, make sure that you have a team of people around you or resources available so that you can find other professionals. Like when my athletes ask me about strength and conditioning or dealing with injuries, I go, go talk to Scott. He was my trainer. He'll help you guys out. He'll write you a program. I don't even answer. Even if I know the answer, I won't do it. It's not, I'm not in my lane. We have these lanes built out and you should have a community around you to help the people that come into your life. And you, you should take it upon yourself if you don't have those resources to go get them because you know people come into your life looking for these resources. And instead of lying about the answer, right, provide a professional resource or a professional outlet to help these people get to what they're trying to do. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Travis, if people want to check you out, if they want to see your work, if they want to get in touch with you, they want to get your instructionals, how do they find you? My Instagram is probably the easiest one that I check the most often. You can also go to usajudo.com. Jimmy and I built an online learning platform for people to learn judo in a methodical, systematic way that's safe for anybody that they can do at home, even if they have no experience. And like anybody else, you can find all of my instructionals on BJJ Fanatics. (laughs) Of course. (laughs) Awesome. Well, again, Travis, I, I greatly appreciate it. And of course, to anyone who wants to dig deeper into the BJJ mental model stuff, The website is bjjmentalmodels.com, full roster there of all of the podcast episodes. We've done over 150 at this point, plus a full database of the concepts we talk about and a contact form if you got a question for me. And of course, if you want to dig even further into that, you can go to premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. That's our subscription site where there's a ton of more advanced courseware and strategy content, plus some coaching for myself and other members of the community. Again, premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. So Travis, thanks again, man. It's great to have you back on the show. I really do appreciate this chat. I think it's a fun one, man. I mean, gold setting is something that people don't talk about enough in the context of jujitsu, even in the context of broader sports. So as someone who's been both an accomplished coach and competitor, I really appreciated getting your perspective on this stuff. Yeah, of course. Happy to do it. They're always, they're always fun to do. They're always enlightening. Goal setting is really something I use day to day in anything. I want to do like I pick a point I want to get to and then I decide on the steps of how to get there awesome so thanks again and of course to everyone who listens here with us every week thanks to you as well for the time and attention and we'll talk to you guys next week 